Okay, good afternoon. Um, I'm super delighted to be here. Thank you so much to the organizing committee for inviting me. Um, we have a wonderful mix of caregivers and parents and scientists, and hopefully there'll be a little bit of something for everyone, and I guarantee that you'll have something to take home with you at the end of this lecture. So my task was, uh, by the way, I am a child and adolescent psychiatrist, so everybody's been poking fun at psychiatry today, um, but that's okay. Um, and my task was to talk about actually what I do, which is I walk inside people's brains every single day. So my task is to tell you how the brain works in Prader-Willi syndrome. Now, if we can't figure out the genes, Ellie, how are we going to figure out how the brain works and what those genes do? But I guarantee you that those genes that are involved in metabolism also have a profound effect in the brain. So the objectives today are to understand how the characteristics associated with PWS emerge across development, to become familiar with the methods that study brain activity to identify structural and functional differences in Prader-Willi syndrome, to describe how brain differences in PWS manifest as phenotypic domains, to appreciate individual differences in these domains, and to learn ways to manage these domains through environmental management and caregiver <coughs> communication and interaction. And there's no way I'm going to be able to do that in 20 minutes, but I'm going to try really hard. So I know that the root of everything is in the genes. And I am very interested in imprinting. And there are a number of psychiatrists who are as well, because there is this theory about imprinting that does have an impact on how the brain works. So in all of us, the blue genes provide the blueprints to enable the brain to adapt to the body's environment inside and out. And that's what I mean, interactionally with the world and also inside with respect to our viscera and our GI tract. These are missing or not expressed in Prader-Willi syndrome, and it leads to a broken system. So Prader-Willi syndrome is really my favorite ADD, not attention problems, but adaptability deficit disorder. And it is. Our guys across the board have deficits in adapting to situations. So when we look at genetic imprinting, what's in the genes, <laughs> Um, imprinted genes contain a memory tracer to indicate which parent they came from. A biochemical marker determines whether it's mother's gene or father's gene, and it also determines when that's going to be expressed. And I think that there is a role for the snow RNAs that regulate the way genes turn off and on as you grow. Um, and imprinting, we know, is a feature of placental mammals. And the reason for that is that the paternal genes are responsible for manage the, managing the environment, the, development, the developing fetus. We know for sure that that's true in mouse models. I know it's a big leap to go from mouse to man, but I do know in studying, uh, looking at the genetics of the placenta, it's not all dad, it's dad and mom and dad and mom. But just like those snow RNAs that regulate the way that genes turn off and on as you grow, that's what happens. So there are other kinds of genetic imprinting, and it is active in the brain. We know from mice that when you create a chimera, which is a mouse that has only paternal genes or only maternal genes, we know that the brain structures around the hypothalamus are derived from paternal genes, whereas the brain structures in the cortex are derived from maternal genes. So what that means is that you can thank your mom for your IQ points. So what we see is that the area in the blue brain, the structures in the blue brain, which is the first that, I'm, that I highlighted here, these are the ones that are uh, coded from dad. And then the, 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 the cortex uh, is basically um, maternal. That, I'm taking big license here, but just go with me. Um, so the blue brain is responsible for adaptability, temperament, nurturing, and stress response. And these are the things that are relatively deficient in Prader-Willi syndrome. So it really, this theory sort of does hang together. Now I want to assure you that be, when you leave here today, you will have your brain with you. And the reason is you carry your brain in the palm of your hand. So what I'm going to indicate is just use your left hand, take your thumb, and press it to the palm of your hand. And now what I want you to do is I want you to take your fingers and I want you to wrap it over your thumb. You have your brain. In fact, you have two hemispheres. <laughs> 
So the, this area where you pressed your thumb to your palm, that is the command control center of your brain, and that is the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus does amazing things, and it does it all automatically, whether we're awake or whether we're asleep. And these are all the regulatory systems that are dysfunctional in Prader-Willi syndrome. PWS is a feedback deficit disorder. Um, we heard a lot today about the vagus nerve, and we heard a lot about um, uh, parts of the brain and, and how parts of the brain might interact with other parts of the brain. And this is absolutely true in PWS. There are many aspects of this regulatory system that are broken. We know that the neonatal phenotype is evident by the eighth month of gestation. And we know that because of abnormal movements, fetal growth differences, body and body proportion differences in the fetus, and also increased amniotic fluid, which I think is an early marker that kids, infants, fetuses in utero are actually not sucking and swallowing the fluid. We know that our infants are born in stress with failure to thrive and endocrine deficiency, as, um, as Dr. Reinfeld talked about with the deficit in oxytocin. Oxytocin also has some amazing other effects on the brain as well. These homeostatic mechanisms are broken in PWS. Um, infants don't particularly show interest in hunger. They don't cry. They don't, certainly don't have any kind of um, thirst mechanism that's active. This is evidence of a broken feedback system. And they also have diminished capacity to communicate distress. But they also have increased drives. And I believe strongly um, that the increased interest in food and hyperphagia occurs when the frontal reward circuits are beginning to mature. Those are the circuits that are outside this deficit area. And it starts around two years of age and progresses through age four. And I think that when we start to see the symptoms of increased interest in food and also the first tantrum, I think that those are indicators that this particular part of the brain is maturing. I'm also keenly aware that although ghrelin may have an increase in appetite in the rest of us, that system is broken in PWS. But what ghrelin does do is it shapes reward for food, and that memory lingers. And so when our folks are introduced to those foods, they remember how tasty and delicious they were, um, and they will want them again, and they will want them more. We also know that leptin insensitivity adds to the energy <laughs> imbalance in weight gain. So here's our brain, and this is the orbital frontal cortex, and this is associated with reward-based learning, and individuals with PWS are very good at this. We believe that eating is a learned behavior and is sustained because it is rewarding. Excessive and repetitive behavior applies to anything that is rewarding in PWS, and the decision to search out and acquire these rewarding things is goal-directed behavior, and this is enhanced in PWS. We also know that the breaking mechanisms, those we attribute to satiety or habituation, they are faulty in PWS, both because of hardwired deficits as well as neurotransmitter deficits, and that's primarily related to GABA. So what we believe is that PWS has increased drives that result in increased reward for pleasure-seeking behaviors, which includes food seeking and food intake, as well as other excessive and repetitive behaviors. And that combined with that is an attenuated feedback system. And that is evidenced by relative insensitivity to hunger signals, satiety, habituation response, decreased pain and disgust, and decreased social disapproval. So in PWS, more is better, and he or she does not know when enough is enough. And once he or she learns something with reinforcement, they will never forget it. So that gives us an inkling into the contextual learning in PWS. Our individuals attach emotional significance to episodic events, and those form expectations. They remember these contextual cues, especially with respect to food seeking, but they also remember it with respect to stories that they might tell to people, because they're utterly consistent in those stories, person to person. They may change up the paradigm, but they were always consistent in that context. 
They also have a very keen understanding of social hierarchy and they can sniff out the power dynamics of a social situation better than some of us. They also have impaired reverse learning. It's hard for all of us, but folks with PWS have find great difficulty with this. So trying to convince them that they are wrong is impossible and punishment does not work. In fact, punishment paradigms, that would be losing something that you want or getting something that you don't want, actually increase the likelihood that inappropriate behavior will continue to occur. And it also increases negative emotions toward the person who's wielding that punishment. So you're only going to make them mad. So what do you do in impaired reverse learning situations? You teach a new paradigm in a new context with reinforcement. So I'll give you an example. Individuals sitting at the dinner table may become a little lax in their, um, in their manners. Um, and so instead of saying, you know, use your fork, uh, put your napkin on your lap, um, instead of doing that, you can say, tonight we're going to have restaurant night. You know, and you put on the tablecloth and you set the table with a nice china and then you teach the appropriate behavior. Um, then they will do it. And that re relates to contentment. Everyone's happy, including you. So in addition to this orbital frontal cortex, there's another layer that develops. And this is the prefrontal cortex um, that is associated with evaluating risk and reward, making decisions, and learning appropriate behavior. This is responsible for what we call executive functions. So these are attention, initiation, monitoring, inhibition, shifting, shifting attention, emotional control, planning and organizing, organizing materials, and also working <coughs> memory. Now what's interesting is that there are executive function deficits in PWS for sure. Task shifting is one of the most um, significant uh, in interfering with daily activities. Uh, inhibition also is impaired. Working memory is deficient. That's why we suggest that when you're putting rules or expectations that you always visually post them, uh, display them. Uh, emotional control, planning and organizing, monitoring and managing time. These are dif difficult things for our folks with PWS. But they do have some assets. And these assets, in fact, get in the way. Because they're very good at visually monitoring. They want things to be just so. They have to complete a set. They sustain their vigilance, uh, which actually makes them very, very good in workshop settings because they rarely get bored. Um, they need to finish things before moving on. They're sensitive to the rules of others uh, and, like we call it, the PWS police, <laughs> but they don't monitor their own behavior. So judgment and problem solving are impaired, and they are impaired regardless of the IQ potential of the individual. Food security, which we'll talk about tomorrow, is, can actually be used as a tool for behavioral analysis because behavior problems are analyzed not from a functional point of view, that is what occurs after the behavior, uh, why, why the person does the behavior, but also from a perceptual point of view of the person. So what was the person expecting out of that particular behavior? And that helps you then reason back to find out what the problem is. And of course, tomorrow we'll learn that it's not just food security, it's everything security for PWS. And that produces contentment, physiological contentment, which is your best friend. So behavior can be understood and prevented by considering their point of view, always. So there is this tension in the brain um, between the reward centers and also the inhibitory centers, which are sort of like the socializing centers, uh, which keep us socially appropriate and keep th those rewards in check, uh, but also help us display appropriate social behaviors. Um, and this presents uh, conflict in PWS because we have our guys have deficiencies in GABA. And GABA is the, is the major inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. It's the whoa, wait a minute neurotransmitter. It's active in the frontal lobe and GABA deficiencies end in more impulsivity, those are those tantrums that you see, less inhibition about their, emotional, uh, their emotional feelings um, and how they get involved in, in their goal-directed behavior. And they also play a significant role in the global feedback deficit. 
So in PWS, once he or she starts something, they are likely to continue doing it. So I want to mention just some of the, uh, the studies that have been done looking at brains. Um, because we, we do our best um, to try to visualize them. And I think uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging studies have really provided a lot of information about how individuals with PWS uh, are different from individuals who have just regular obesity. Um, and you saw some of the phenomenological studies um, by Zip and Holland looking at the satiety, the, those original satiety graphs with the chicken salad sandwiches. Well, this particular study was done by Holson um, and it really s looked at the re importance of reward and this prefrontal circuitry that I've been talking about in hunger and satiety. And so she looked at uh, the fMRIs in people with PWS and compared with uh, obese people post-meal response to food. So this is after you've eaten, and then they show you pictures of uh, food. And so what they found was that in individuals who are just obese, you see, this is comparing both PWS and obesity. Um, the individuals who had obesity had activation of these inhibitory centers in the cortex after a meal. And that makes sense. After you've eaten, you want to have your cortex tell you, you that the, the appropriate decision to make is to stop eating. Um, but what happened in PWS is that after the meal, there was this continued um, increase in function in the reward areas deep in the brain. That's the blue brain. Um, there was persistent activation of these centers. We've also um, come to uh, do a different kind of study which looks at functional connectivity. This is really an interesting way of doing an fMRI. So what this does is it's in the resting state and it looks at how the, what the activity of the brain is in a number of networks that we know associate together in the brain. And what Zhang did was he looked at um, individuals with PWS and compared them to their siblings. And so this is what the, the functional connectivity scans look like. So you can see the brains with all their different undulations. Um, but then he takes them and he makes this lovely graph that looks at various parts of the brain. So I represented the blue brain here and also the pink brain um, so that you can see. And HYP is actually the hypothalamus. And if you keep in mind that every action has, an, has, has an, a reaction, when you have a deficit area in the brain, the brain is going to try to cope and compensate for itself. Um, and in Prader-Willi syndrome, this is what happens. In the resting state, you see an overwhelming uh, connectivity between the amygdala, which is the part of the brain which is fight or flight, but it also puts action to emotion. Um, and you see that this is trying to correct for that deficit area in the hypothalamus. And you can also see that the relative valence, those big blue arrows, um, are significantly larger than that pink arrow that's coming from the frontal cortex. So what happens is that there's a net increase in what we call bottom-up processing. So that's this part of the brain that's active. And what we see is a relative decrease in top-down processing, especially under stress. In fact, stress biases the brain to bottom-up processing as opposed to top-down processing. This is true in all of us, but it is very true in PWS. So what we typically see in PWS is that with stress, that a typical person's baseline personality, which we call that phenotype or PWS personality, has an increase in intensity under stress. Um, and then at some point there's a tipping and then aberrant behaviors occur. And what that is indicative of is that the coping strategies that the person has tried to use to hold things together are no longer working. We know that stress alters behavior in all of us and it increases the use of automatic behaviors. Those are the behaviors where we act without thinking or those behaviors that are self-soothing. These are the compulsive, repetitive, habit-style behaviors. And if you think about our guys, they do that all the time. Stressed. Stressed is not good for you. It is not good for your child. It's not good for your patient. Um, what's amazing is that individuals um, who work with people who have Prader-Willi syndrome also experience increased stress. 
It goes mothers are most stressed, then fathers, then caregivers, then actual administrators of schools or, or uh, provider programs. Um, so that stress just trickles right down the line. So the take home lesson is when the person is stressed, they're going to be leading with their emotional brain. You can't talk to this part of the brain. You can only talk to this part of the brain. And so you either have to wait until that episode uh, uh, basically resets itself after a tantrum, um, or you have to do really good prevention um, so that you can keep the person uh, environmentally intact. So there are many interpersonal aspects of intervention that I think are real important as take homes. Be interested, be understanding, be upbeat, be positive because those negatives don't help. Be accepting, be forgiving, be proactive, be firm, and be open to new experience always. And some of the communication patterns that you can have with your individuals would be, be aware of your own verbal and nonverbal aspects because they will pick up on that. That's this part of the brain. <laughs> your body posture, your emotional expression uh, will have an effect on them. Your best friend is what we call low expressed emotion. So you, you don't get super excitable. You can be natural, uh, but for sure, don't raise your voice because they will only hear the tone of voice or the volume of your voice. They will not hear what you say. You always want them to hear the words that you're saying. You want to use the least number of words that you can. So it's not, George, the plate belongs in the sink. You say, George, plate in sink. The message gets clear. Convey one request at a time. So moms will say, okay, uh, go upstairs, unpack your book bag, um, and wash your hands. And so mom's noticing the time's going, and so she goes to the top of the steps, and there's her son standing there with his book bag because he only heard go upstairs. Language choice should reflect the order of action. If you do have to give more than one directive, make sure that it's in the order that it's supposed to be. Um, and please remember that our guys are not good at remembering more than one thing. Um, and in fact, when they are, are preoccupied with something, they're going to be less able to focus on what you're asking them to do. And allow time for processing to delay. Um, because our guys do have processing difficulties, which can add to listener fatigue and cause difficulties um, with um, interpersonal interaction, especially with social skills. So there is a developmental progression of the phenotypic behaviors. And in my opinion, as a psychiatrist walking in the brain every day, I believe that this is related to maturation of the brain. I think that food increase, food interest, increases around two to three years, around the same time as the first tantrum, and this reflects maturation of the reward centers in the brain. This is food interest, that's the reward. It's not the actual, t it's not the actual increase in eating. Repetitive asking about events emerges as soon as kids can talk, about three to four years of age, and it is actually more intense than talking or arguing about food. They want to know what's going to happen next. Temper tantrums and problems with transitions increase steadily through childhood, peak around eight to 10 years, and they remain at high rates even in adulthood. And older individuals do tend to display a trend toward fewer food-related behaviors, and they may, in fact, mellow over, over time. This may have something to do with genetic subtype. So we look at the PWS personality as having five domains that drive related behavior that is both food and non-food related, the <coughs> impulsive and disruptive behaviors, largely the tantrums, um, that respond to disappointment, it's disappointed expectations. Anxiety and stress sensitivity, which we know are true across the board. The cognitive rigidity, which is that perseveration, the need for things to be the same, the need for the routine to be exactly as predicted. And then, of course, we know that skin picking occurs, but not in everyone. And so when you look at all of these domains, um, I think it's very interesting to note that there can be differences person to person. 
Um, and so um, when, you, when you consider these, uh, we've come up with a rating scale, uh, which will hopefully be available online. This is not a research tool, it's a clinical tool. Because my opinion is that if we can figure out what these profiles look like, we'll be able to develop an individualized treatment plan that is <laughs> ideally suited to the individual. So you can see here, not every person is the same. So some people might have moderate food drive and really not much in the way of non-food seeking. Um, oppositional behavior may be different from cognitive rigidity. And some individuals may have high or low skin picking. So hopefully by this kind of a conceptual framework, you'll be able to see where your child or your patient um, fits within the world of Prader-Willi syndrome. So the other thing is that um, since we're primarily educators and uh, clinical consultants, um, if you go to our website, um, which is www.pittsburghpartnership.com, there's a lot of educational materials there. Um, and tomorrow I'll talk about some of those other paradigms. Hi. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering uh, when you're talking about um, reward mechanisms that even negative reward would be considered exactly the same in terms of repeating a behaviour. So as long as they're getting some kind of reaction, that negative reaction would also fall into that category. So not necessarily a positive reward. Yes, but that's going to create anxiety, yes. um, which is not a good thing. No, 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 no. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Is there something that you can do to change the food, to use a different sort of reward instead of food? Yes, um, I think that. So that food doesn't become the. Yeah, so the question is um, if the food reward starts early in life, is there something that we can do um, uh, aside from the, the delicious, rewarding quality of food to sort of reinforce? Um, I think it's really complicated because in that dyadic relationship between mom and baby, when that baby who was failure to thrive starts to eat, and starts to actually enjoy food, I think that it's very difficult to not reinforce that. Um, I can tell you that, that many people would advocate not giving sweet, um, high energy carbohydrate kinds of foods that are likely to trigger the rewards or high fats that are likely to trigger reward mechanisms. Um, and I can tell you that in, um, in Canada, where the red, yellow, green diet has been studied extensively, that there are some individuals who have never had candy. And they have n no desire to have it because they don't have any memory or any kind of context in which to appreciate it. Um, tomorrow we're going to talk about the value of sensory integration and how important that is. Um, and so I think any other kind of way to stimulate the senses um, is, is powerfully rewarding and will have a much better impact on that, brain growth. I was going, that, that uh, I mean, what you say makes absolute sense. And I was going to say, obviously, if you didn't realize your child had this condition, which earlier on people often didn't, then the child started eating and responding, of course you'd be. Right. But now with so much that we know, and you know, I've met a few parents here who've got very young children, and with that sort of foreknowledge, if it does indeed help, make a big difference. Right. And so, you know, uh, one of the developmental tasks uh, in infancy is to become um, uh, connected with a dietary consultant as soon as possible. Um, and I think that those are the people that really need to uh, be aware of the reward mechanism and how powerful that is. Um, and maybe they can direct to um, better energy efficient foods rather than the ones that are so delicious. Um, I've got a seven-year-old boy with Prader Willi syndrome, and he is extremely repetitive mm -hmm. um, on a daily basis. It doesn't have to be about food; it can be about anything. It can be about routine. It can be about what's coming up over the week, the month. Um, it doesn't really matter. But yeah, constant repetitive. Um, you can answer the question a thousand times, and you're still going to get the same question again. And if he doesn't get an answer from me, he'll go to dad or somebody else. 
how do you stop that behavior? Okay, so, so the question is about perseveration, which is uh, constant repetition of particular themes um, that, that are of value to the person, because obviously that's why they're asking that question over and over again. Um, it, it is what parents refer to as the slow torture. Um, so it is something that is, is part of that, that phenotype. Um, there are some things that, that you can do um, because I think um, our guys do have a desire to have an interaction. Um, I think part of the problem is that they don't have the, um, uh, the way in which they can do an appropriate social interaction. So keep in mind what we said about, you know, you really can't extinguish a behavior, but you can teach a new context teach a new behavior in a new context. And I think that's where developing early those social speech patterns and social skills, um, I think are very, very helpful. Um, so you can turn it into a learning experience. And I know Scott's gonna talk about that tomorrow. Um, uh, uh, the other thing is that there are some things that you can do. Um, you, if you know what the person is uh, perseverating on, um, that's why I like that visualized schedule um, so that they can refer to that um, and you can recommend that they go see what's on the schedule. Um, if, if you know what it is that they're going to ask, um, you can uh, do a ticket system where there are three cards and that you will only answer three times. And then after that, everybody knows because you've said what it is, you just give it low, low attention. Now there are some individuals who um, have a nonverbal learning disability um, and also have Prader-Willi syndrome and those individuals really use their speech patterns as sonar and it's this way of sort of defining where they are in space because our guys really don't have a good way of putting themselves into space. Um, so I think understanding uh, the learning um, assets and limitations in your child would also be helpful. thinking about this, having some settings with the guys, I know that, like, if I'm getting repetitive, it's not going to help, because he still asked it. <laughs> so, I actually asked, put the question back from her, and I asked her, all right, Debbie, when we actually started going from home, what we discussed, and that actually stopped her straight away, and then she started thinking, oh, put the question back, and then she tried to reply back to that question, and then we take her back to her answer by that, and once she replied that answer by her Yes, the, and, and, and I think... And the also the same thing that you just said, after doing that, you just put the same thing back to her, all right, you just answered that question, now we are not going to discuss that. Right. Exactly, so it actually lifts up the thing as well that you said afterwards. So it, right. It worked really well with us. So I think the important thing is if you find that you're being reactive, you have to re-examine your, uh, your daily plan. Uh, because that's usually an indication that you're not being proactive enough. And the other thing is our guys do have other kinds of activities that are highly reinforcing, like music. Um, and they, they may not be good at singing, uh, but they're really, they really <laughs> appreciate a good beat. Um, and they're really good at rhythm. And so, um, you know, playing music or something that gives a competing stimulus, uh, other than just hearing their own voice, might be very helpful. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, what method do you use to activate, like to get your kids more active with Prader Willi syndrome? Um, we're going to talk about that tomorrow with respect to sensory motor integration. Uh, but I, I cannot emphasize enough uh, the role of dads in motor act, sensory motor activity with their children. Um, it's so important. Um, and there are lots of things that, that you can do, and we'll talk about some of them tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.